OK. So who, that's what I'm going to say, all right? So who started to pull up something that caused a major uproar amongst a lot of people with, where they were supposedly starting some kind of treaty? And when they launch this treaty, it seems like it can give them power where they can abide by their own constitution. And I mentioned this in previous teachings a long time ago. I've given the concerns that there were people discussing at the month of March where the U.S. Constitution might be in danger and overridden. By what WHO's, uh, by what who says, actually. So if that's the case, that this is what's going on, this is the mainstream report that happened. The uproar is this, and I'll give further clarification of what's going on with who. The title of their article in their official website is Global Leaders Unite in Urgent Call for International Pandemic Treaty. They said here, the international community should work together towards a new international treaty for pandemic preparedness and response to build a more robust global health architecture that will protect future generations. World leaders said in a commentary published today in several newspapers around the world. The main goal of a new international treaty for pandemic preparedness and response should be to foster a comprehensive multi-sectoral approach to strengthen national, regional, and global capacities and resilience to future pandemics. According to the article, the treaty would be rooted in the constitution of who, drawing in other relevant organizations key to this endeavor. Wow, how about that? So this has been a major uproar amongst some people. And they were wondering if the U.S. Constitution now is in danger because of this Constitution by who? In fact, there was one person who saw it as a dangerous thing going on. And in her article titled, Urgent My Video Call with the Who? This morning by Dr. Tess Laurie, and she has an MBBCH, whatever that is, and a PhD, but she works for the World Council for Health. And actually, they did a video call meeting with some people who worked for who? So this is a big authority figure for the group of people who want to resist against this treaty that's going on. In fact, there were 48 people, she says in her article, on the call at the time I tuned in. 16 of them were WHO staff, others were from UNAIDS, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, the UN Environment Program, the Association of Thou South East Asian Nations. Now, I don't know if you know, but these are big named international organizations, powerful organizations. So she had a big say on this matter. But in her viewpoint, this was something that endangered our own constitution and the country. Now, there are criticisms against this. So then one is they will say that, well, this is just simply a discussion. This is not something official where they're going to, where they will have a treaty set up. But nevertheless, there's still a concern because this was being brought up on the table. See? That's the bottom line. There's still, that doesn't erase our concerns because this was still brought up at the table about a treaty where they will have the power to make sure that they can implement what their own constitution speaks, not what other countries say. The other criticism, because Snopes is such a reliable article nowadays, is that they will say, well, this has nothing to do where the country's sovereignty is at stake right here. Because who has claimed, and the people in charge of who has claimed, that they, that they have no business to butt into the country's sovereignty. 
that they themselves have the final decision and choice to do what they want to do. So they have the power and the choice to do what they want to do. But this is a problem because let me give you uh, an example. This will infuriate any liberal or people who don't like Bible-believing Christianity. What if your country entrusted Bible Baptist Church with all the spiritual advice and regulations, what our constitution, our religious beliefs are. And the country entrusted us and their job, this is part of whose task, is that what they want to push is that the different countries that technically they're not butting into their sovereignty, but in the sense the countries are still obligated and mandated to report. They are supposed to report their data and then wherever they find the disease to be at, so that's tracking, see that? So that those reports are given out to who? As well as these countries, some of them, and one of the concerns was with Biden where he mentioned, we're gonna give them whatever resources or as much resources, if I wanna be more technically correct, as much resources that we can give to who where they can efficiently do their task on what they deem to be significant. So that is actually correct, okay? Now, let me translate it with this example. If the country here in America, where Biden said, we're going to give whatever power and resources as best as we can to Bible Baptist Church to keep a track record of people's spiritual lives and their growths, so we're keep, and then whatever we deem to be spiritually lacking, right? So just like those who people who can track what they seem to be lacking in health, right, or a danger to health, we ourselves can see what's a danger to spirituality. Let, let me say that Biden and the country here give me that kind of power. Oh boy, that's gonna be a lot of fun for us, right? <laughs> For us, we're going to have a lot of fun and say, yep, that place is spiritually lacking right here. So they need to go to church. Th those people need to read the Bible. Those people need to get saved. They're not saved in Jesus Christ from what I hear their testimony. If I get all those people's private information of, their, of my spiritual expertise, then what do you think the people in this country is going to do? Oh, it's okay. You know, uh, let them do that. No, they'll flip, won't they? Those screaming liberals will scream and get a heart attack. No, you're giving too much power to them. That's the same thing right here. That's the same thing right here. Number two, number two, so what that the country can make the final decision? The point is, then why would the country, especially the president, entrust who to have to do their thing? When you're entrusting and giving the resources to who or to somebody to do that for you, what are you doing? You're yielding, you're relinquishing your authority to them. That's what you're doing because you're entrusting them that their advice is the best and you're going to follow their directions. What do you think Biden's going to do? Give them, the, give them the keys where they can keep their track record and then what they deem as their procedure what's best to their constitution. Biden's going to give them all that help and resources and say, no, I ain't going to do that. Come on, stupid man. When a person like Biden's giving them that kind of access and resource, what does that mean? They're going to obviously follow their directions. All right, this is cuckoo Lulu. These people, they're saying, oh, you know, our sovereignty is not at stake, so don't worry. So use, then let Bible Baptist Church have that kind of power. Let's see how you guys flip. You'll, they'll turn total 180, man. Total 180. Idiots at their finest. And I say amen to that, these people. They don't, they don't know what they're talking about. People are giving up their rights and their liberties so easily, like dumb geese. And they don't know what they're talking about. And they just quack, quack, and... That's all you hear from CNN, MSNBC, and these idiotic major media outlets nowadays. They don't know what they're talking about. 
By the way, it becomes even more concerning, let's say Bible Baptist Church is in charge of misinformation. And then we can shut out and call out what we deem to be misinformation. Let's, God does not exist, say, says an atheist. If I say, well, that's misinformation. And to us it is, amen? amen. Yeah, amen, God exists. But then if I say that, and then people all around the world say, man, what a great authority in spiritual matters, Bible Baptist Church. So, yes, that's misinformation. Wouldn't those liberals flip? Yeah, they'll flip. So then, why are you giving that kind of power to who as well? European Council of the, U Council of the European Union, the title of their article is An International Treaty on Pandemic Prevention and Preparedness. And one of them is addressing misinformation. Because they want people to trust right information. Come on, man. Don't kid me. Go kid your grandmother. You don't know what you're talking about, these people. That's a lot of power. By the way, it's a lot of power because here are some articles here. There are mainstream outlets, big name organizations, and writers that are actually calling out that, hey, who should not only have the power to declare what they deem to be you know, a huge issue, so they have the authorization and power, and then you're supposed to give that kind of data and information, whatever you have, to them. But also, who should have the power to have more teeth, to put sanction, and etc.? How about that? So then, I don't see that as, oh, this is harmless. No, this is something that I should have the right to go, hey, I, I'm afraid of what's going on. My right, my privilege, my sovereignty on my country is at stake here. <laughs> this is from uh, the London School of Economics. Uh, they say here, for this treaty to have teeth, the organization that governs it needs to have the power, either political or legal, to enforce, to enforce compliance. To who? And the title of their article from that, is a new pandemic treaty, what the World Health, what who needs to do next. Here's uh, another reading here, which should be concerning. Um, a UN report from May 2021 20, called for more powers for who, saying in its current form, the who does not possess such powers. To move on with the treaty, who therefore needs to be empowered financially and politically? That's what they said. So all the support must be given to them. How about that? This is pretty concerning right here. Here's another one that they said. This is from, an, uh, this, I believe, from the same UN report. They also mention, let's see. An adaptable incentive regime, including sanctions such as public reprimands, economic sanctions, or denial of benefits. These are the same people who are calling it out, and you're saying that, oh, our, our rights are not at stake here? Come on. Who are you kidding me, man? See, these people don't read. They don't read. They just believe whatever TV says. Why? Because my name is Don Lemon, and I have no PhD in that matter. And what I tell you is the truth. These people. The concern is also where if who has all that kind of power, you know what else they have? It brings to what Christians are wondering about. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Right? And when that happens, is it true that we can get something like that? Title from Reuters. Deutsche Telekom to build global mm -hmm, verification app for who? How about that? From Reuters. Yeah, give, uh, give them the whatever resources they need and the authorization or the power or whatever. It brings us closer to where the Antichrist can set up his what? Mm-hmm-hmm, right? 
We're getting closer to the tribulation and the end times here. We're getting much, much closer. Go to Daniel chapter 9. Now, when people look at this uh, pandemic treaty, what are they thinking? Now, this is what you can find from the scriptures, which is going to be very interesting. What I believe is this. The Antichrist is going to make a covenant. We know that. This is a covenant. And Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. For some of you who don't know, there's a debate going on whether this is uh, God's covenant or is this the Antichrist covenant. I'm going to sh some people mention a dual application. And actually, I'm going to connect all these different opinions together. That might be incredibly eye-opening. This is what I'm going to show you. The covenant, the standard teaching from a lot of uh, Bible end times preachers and theologians is that there's a tribulation that lasts for seven years and the Antichrist will make a covenant for seven years. What I think is where, woohoo, does that little paper that they do or that peace package, I'll call it. I'm online, guys. So <laughs> peace package, whatever they call it. I think that this coincides with the Antichrist, what he's going to do with his peace, peace plan for seven years. That's what I believe. It's all connected. That's what I strongly believe. Now, I don't think that right now what who who is doing is the official uh, Antichrist, uh, what he's going to do with the seven-year covenant. But what I believe is this, is that it's a pre, there's no doubt, a precursor, and then it's going to amp up more and more and more, and eventually, woohoo, is going to be involved with the Antichrist seven-year covenant. What is this seven-year covenant the Antichrist is doing? We know it's with the nation of Israel. How is this all tied together? Get ready for some fun tonight. All right, Daniel 9, 27. Here we go, all right? Daniel 9, 27. Let's go one by one here. The passage reads, and let me know if I'm out of bounds, okay? So the st standard teaching is this, and he, the Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant. So he's making a covenant with many, the Jews, for one week. So that's supposed to represent seven years. Why? One day equals one year. I'm not going to get into that, but that's the standard interpretation from a lot of uh, preachers today. So let's just go along with that. In the midst of the week, so in the middle of the seven years, he, which is the Antichrist, shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So that's the Antichrist in the middle of the covenant he makes with the Jews. He breaks it and then he ruins and desecrates their temple. Now, there are different people who have different opinions on this one. There are some who argue that in Daniel 9, 27, it's actually the Lord, the Lord's covenant, not the Antichrist making a covenant. You might say, why? Because it says confirm. What does confirm mean? To make sure. That means there was already a covenant made with the Jews. Why? Who is it? Why? You just look at the context here. If you look at the context at Daniel chapter 9, notice that the context follows at verse, let's see right here, verse 12. The Bible says, And he hath confirmed what? His words which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. Look at verse 4. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the what? Covenant. So it seems to show right here this is God's covenant. Why? Of verse 24. God's covenant is verse 24. The 70 weeks for who? The Jews. Upon thy, holy upon thy holy city, upon thy people, Daniel. So this is God's covenant to Jews when we look at the context. It's 70 weeks, right? Well, guess what? The last week in that 70 weeks is verse 27. Didn't you know that? The last week in the 70 weeks is verse 27, guys. 
So that's included right here in the 70 weeks. Verse 27, that one week is in that number, 70 weeks. There's no doubt from the context. All you have to read is verse 24 through 27. And that 70 weeks is God making that timeline for Jews. So that's why they argue that this is God's covenant. Okay. However, I see something different. Look at Daniel 11, Daniel chapter 11. The problem is Daniel 11. When you look at Daniel 11, it says at verse 22, And with the arms of, the flood, of a flood shall they be overflown from before him, and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. Right? You know that matches with Daniel 9, uh, 26. Daniel 9, 26. Okay, look at those two verses, all right? If you look at Daniel 9, 26, the, the verses... And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the who? Prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Doesn't that match with Daniel chapter 11 verse 22? Yeah. Okay. Who is this prince of the covenant, right? Who is this prince of the covenant? Look at verse 23. That's no doubt the Antichrist. And after the league made with him, see, the ant, uh, there, there's a covenant, right? The league that's made. He shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with the small people. Does that sound like God or does that sound like the Antichrist to you? Sounds like the Antichrist, right? Verse 24, he shall enter peaceably, even upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. Why, that does not sound like God, obviously, then. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches. Yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds, even for a time. Okay, so this sounds like the Antichrist right here. Verse 21 is very plain. That's not God, verse 21. And in his estate shall stand up a what? Vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Okay, so we can see this is the Antichrist. But we got a problem here. When he makes that covenant at verse 22, right? Prince of the covenant, do you see that? Mm -hmm. The problem is God calls it a holy covenant. What? The covenant the Antichrist makes is a holy covenant? That doesn't make sense. You might say, how so? Well, all you have to do is just keep reading down. When you keep reading down, Come on, brother, the verse points out that it's actually a holy covenant. Verse 22, prince of the covenant, league made with him, right? Then at verse 27, he's speaking lies at one table. So that sounds like a covenant making. And verse 28, it's not evil. Verse 28 then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the what? Holy covenant. That's so confusing. It's a holy covenant? If it's holy covenant, if it's God's covenant, then Daniel 9, 27 will make sense because we got two problems here. One is right here. It says confirm the covenant, right? And context is stronger, if we're going to be honest, at Daniel 9. It's God's covenant to Israel. Daniel 11, it will support that with holy covenant. But come on, guys, when you read the passage, it's about the Antichrist. Yeah. So there are some people who separate Daniel 9 from Daniel 11. I don't think so. The author, he's using the same wording here. Yeah. So it's got to be the same person. This might be very eye-opening. <laughs> All right. Here's the thing. God's covenant... Did you forget what it was? What was it with Israel? Their land will be restored. Their practices, their temple rites and sacrifices will be restored. Use your head now. When the Antichrist makes a covenant with the Jews, is he going to go against that at the beginning? Or do you think he'll confirm that? He'll confirm it. Why? Because, as I've taught you before, the Antichrist is from that group of people. He's a Jew, remember? 
So he has to, how is he going to successfully come out like Jesus Christ? I am Jesus Christ. I am from the tribe of Judah. I'm a Jew like you. Let's re rebuild the temple. Let's regather the people. The Messiah is here. Yeah, he's going to confirm God's covenant. But what he's going to do is, at the same time, he's lying. Yeah, there it is. He, what he's going to do is break the covenant. So he confirms it, but he breaks it. What's your evidence? Daniel 9.27. Yeah. The verse says that he confirms it, but what? In the middle, there's something that breaks. Yeah. But look at the reading here. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of what? Abominations. That phrase, when I see the abomination that maketh desolate, that phrase I see a very strongly as tribulation reference when I compare that with Matthew 24 uh, and other passages, at Daniel 11. That's all Antichrist. That's all Antichrist. They try to connect it with Matthew 23, some people, but no, not with the language and the wording here, especially when Jesus said what was prophesied by Daniel, the prophet at Matthew 24. This is all tribulation here. I see this as the Antichrist doing something evil and wicked. When there's an abomination involved, that's not God I see that as. I see that more as the devil. It makes more sense that the devil is involved in something abominable, not the Lord. To the Lord, the abominable is separated from him in the lake of fire. Revelation 21.8, right? Mm -hmm. So that would make sense more with the devil. But let's look at scripture with scripture. Ezekiel 44.7. Ezekiel 44.7. Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 7. Some of our brothers who've already heard about this, this teaching about the covenant and went through many different theories, they're missing out tonight. Yeah. <laughs> they're really missing out tonight. Really? They would have enjoyed this one. All right, look at Ezekiel chapter 44, and then we'll read verse 7. Look at right here, Ezekiel chapter 44. And then we'll read verse 7. The Bible says, In that ye have brought into my sanctuary... Kind of like Daniel 9, 27, right? Sanctuary. Strangers uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh to be in my sanctuary, to pollute it, even my house. That matches with Daniel 9, 27, right? Has to do with the temple, God's house, where the abomination make it desolate. When he offer my bread, the fat and the blood, and they have broken my covenant because of all your what? abominations. That verse matches well with Daniel 9, 27. What can break the covenant? What breaks the covenant is something evil. And these words are matching well with Daniel 9, 27 on what can break a covenant. What can break a covenant is something abominable. How about that? Now this is a, go to Galatians 3, Galatians 3, 17, Galatians 3, 17. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's not abominable, amen? He's not evil. So when he makes a covenant and confirms it, it cannot be broken. But when there's some so-and-so who claims to be Christ and he's abominable and evil, he breaks, he can break the covenant. Look at Galatians 3, 17. And this I say that the covenant that was what? Confirmed before of God in what? In Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. It cannot be broken. Jesus won't break his covenant with Israel, but the Antichrist can break the covenant with Israel. Does that make a lot of sense here? Does that make a lot of sense? Because God's covenant won't be blessed through the Antichrist when something abominable happens. No, that don't apply to the Antichrist. It only applies to Christ where it cannot be broken. So then think about this. This verse is powerful where Christ confirms it cannot be broken. Imagine a person who claims to be that Christ and says, I confirm the covenant. That's Antichrist, isn't it? See, the devil, when he reads this passage, what do you think he's thinking? How am I going to replace Jesus Christ? He's going to take all the promises about Jesus Christ here, verses like this one that apply to Jesus Christ, 
for himself. Is, it, is this making a lot more sense? That's why I can see here that it is a holy covenant right here because it's God's covenant of restoring the nation of Israel. But someone abominable is holding it. No, no one abominable, no one wicked can touch the holy things of God. Really? Hasn't the devil tried to touch that holy Bible and produced a lot of corruption? Isn't our body called the holy temple of God and the devil has put a lot of evil, abominable stuff in this? Don't you think that it's not a problem for the devil to do something with the holy temple as well and make it abominable? Daniel 9.27 said that. This is really eye-opening, right? Now, this is double application. I'm so I have one here, God's covenant. The second as peep covenant, all right? So we can guess this peep covenant has to do with whoo, whoo, all right? So then what? How are these tied together? Zechariah 11. This is going to be interesting. Zechariah 11. Now, I'm going to say this is just my opinion, okay? This is not doctrine. And if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. But I want to help out the Bible-believing community by giving out my two cent, and maybe they can connect the dots even more, and other Bible-believing teachers can show the doctrine more clearly. Wouldn't that be a blessing? That's the job of us Bible believers, to help each other out when we study deep doctrine together. It's a together aspect, not a solo aspect, a rogue aspect where we try to divide. That's not my intention. Go to Zechariah chapter 11. We'll look at verse 7. And I will feed the flock of slaughter, even you, O poor of the flock. And I took unto me two staves, the one I call beauty, and the other I call bands, and I fed the flock. Now, God has two staves here. I wrote two things here, okay? Now, he has two staves. One he calls beauty, the other he calls band. Now, if you keep reading right here, verse 10, And I took my staff, even beauty, so that's one, and cut it asunder, that I might break my what? Covenant, which I had made with all the people. And it was broken in that day. And so the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. So notice right here, God breaks his covenant. But we know later on that God, he will restore, right? God, he will restore the nation of Israel, give a new covenant. That's a totally different teaching. That's found at Hebrews 8, okay? But let's follow along here. So he breaks the covenant. When he breaks the covenant with the sheep, what timeline is this applied to? Verse 12, and I said unto them, if ye think good, give me my price. And if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. Yeah. Come on. So when God breaks that covenant with Israel, that's his first coming, right? You can tell. That's when Judas Iscariot takes the 30 pieces of silver. And then that covenant in Zechariah gets broken. Wow. Now, Look at uh, the book of Luke. Uh, Matthew, actually. Go, look at the book of Matthew. Matthew. Now, Judas Iscariot, if you know your Bible, he is going to be the Antichrist, okay? Mm -hmm. So notice that the Antichrist shows up in the first advent of Jesus Christ. Look at the bu book of Matthew. And then we'll look at uh, chapter, let's see here. Uh, I wrote down the verse, but then I lost it here. Okay, we're going to look at Matthew 26. Here we go. Matthew 26, verse 14. Matthew 26, 14. Now look at this. When God breaks, when, a, when God's covenant is broken, can the devil make his own covenant at the same time? Yeah. Look at right here, Zechariah, covenant get broken, but then the Antichrist makes his own covenant. Look at right here, Matthew 26, based on 30 pieces of silver, right? Yeah. Matthew 26, 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will ye give me, and I will deliver him unto you? And they, what? Covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. Wow. How about that? Now, obviously, I'm not saying that uh, the covenant in Zechariah is applicable to uh, the first advent of Jesus Christ with Judas, but the point is this. The point is, is that 
When God breaks a covenant, at this, what God can do also, he can recognize that the devil will make his own covenant. So think about this. Common sense. Wouldn't the Antichrist in the future, it's, not, it's a no-brainer where he can break God's covenant while simultaneously he has his own covenant set up? Hmm. So then, the, you mean really? Yeah, there is. Because sometimes, you know, when you go to business meetings and then sometimes you get those sneaky deals of contract, but then there's another contract you didn't know about. They make you sign the dotted line with this contract, but then they have another contract that you didn't know about that they want to sneak and use up on you. That's what the Antichrist is going to do. The Antichrist, he has another covenant that I'm going to show you. That's why I wrote two here. It's this one. So he's going to confirm this, but he's lying behind the scenes and then has a backup, a different covenant set up. But let's keep read. Go back to Zechariah 11. I hope your hand's there. That's the first one he broke, right? As Zechariah 11. Beauty, right? Which we read. He's going to break the other one now at verse 14. Bands, okay? Verse 14, verse 14. Does the Antichrist come out again? Yes, he comes out again. Look at verse 14. Then I cut asunder mine other staff, even bands, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. And the Lord said unto me, Take unto thee yet the instruments of a who? Foolish shepherd. Jesus is the great shepherd, right? Amen, amen then who would be the wrong shepherd, the foolish shepherd? That's, the de that's not Christ, that's Antichrist. But look at the language here. This is Antichrist. Look at the language here. Verse 16. For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land which shall not visit those that be cut off, neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still, but he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear their claws in pieces. Woe to the idol shepherd that leaveth the flock the sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye his arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened for some of you who didn't know verse 17 is a passage used by a lot of bible scholars about the antichrist getting assassinated yeah. so notice the antichrist is involved right here the second time the second time how about that then what's this Second time here. One time, the Antichrist made a covenant, 30 pieces of silver, right, to betray Jesus. So this is all Zechariah 11, 7. Look at this. Zechariah 11, 7. When those two things are broken, the Antichrist makes a covenant at the same time. When God breaks his covenant, the Antichrist makes his own covenant. One was Judas Iscariot, 30 pieces of silver betraying the Lord. The second, Judas Iscariot or Antichrist makes a covenant. Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28. And by the way, this treaty has to do with being rescued and avoiding a P or a disease or a widespread uh, no, disease. That's what this covenant entails. You know that? That's what the Antichrist is going to make. That's why it's related to hoo hoo. I see that. We got Isaiah 28. Now remember, Bible study is boring, okay? Maybe we should end it right here and go home, right? Isaiah chapter 28, verse 15. Beca this is, uh, for some of you who don't know, this is about the tribulation, the covenant, okay? Look at this. Because ye have said, we have made a covenant with what? Death and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing what? Scourge. That's that huge widespread disease. Shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. That's the Antichrist make that covenant. For we have made lies our refuge. Yeah, because he always lied. This was his backup contract. He lied about this contract. And under falsehood have we hid ourselves. But what did God say? God said at verse 18, And your covenant with death shall be disannulled. 
and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. You'll notice right here that God made sure to mention that, no, they're going to be trodden down by it. They're going to, it's not going to work. Their covenant with death and hell. Did you recall Revelation chapter 6? Death and hell wipe out what? So many of the people. And that relates to what? Scourge yeah. at verse 15. That's a widespread disease. Yes, I believe a, there is another covenant that relates to this. That's the Antichrist covenant. But he has to confirm the thing with Israel too. So this is intensely interesting. I don't know how the pieces connect here, but I'm opening up Pandora's yeah, box where people yeah. can connect. <laughs> I think that when the Antichrist makes this kind of covenant with that relates to who? It has to do with something as a backup plan with Israel. There's something going on. When he confirms it with Israel, there's something going on here. So let me give you my wild theory. Maybe it might make sense because of the tension going on with Ukraine and Russia that people are learning to eliminate a whole ethnicity or ban a whole ethnicity or want to view a whole ethnicity as the bad guys, right? Yeah. A whole country of people as bad guys, right? Yeah. Russians. You combine that with another thing where we went through the past two years, right? And then they want to protect the safety of the people. But then there's a certain crowd right here who won't comply. And they're just causing more harm than good to the greater public here. That's what they've been teaching the past two years, right? Yeah. Now combine these two events together, what do you get in the psychology and the minds of the people? You're going to get something where these group of people are not going to go along with the Antichrist system. At the beginning they do though. That's why you see the nation of Israel really following the Antichrist system right now. But when he confirms it, he betrays them. Because the Antichrist sets up an image to worship, and it's all connected to that. They're not going to follow along with that, especially when Moses and Elijah and the 144,000 in the tribulation start to send the revival and open the Jews' eyes. So then they're not going to comply. Well, just like how we viewed Russia back then as, hey, we're going to sanction and cut off everything, everything and how people viewed a whole country and group of people as bad and not want to do anything with them. And if this ties, if, uh, excuse me, if this one is tied to anything where the Antichrist wants to aim for Israel, he's going to go, no, I have to think about the peace and safety. And he might go, because of the peace and safety, I'm going to have to break this one that I make because he, the devil always had his eyes on that temple anyway. He wants to reign in that temple, not Jesus Christ. So it was all a trick from the Antichrist. And then how is he going to deceive the people? Remember this covenant. The scourge is spreading. Like how we did with Russia, we have to learn our lesson and do the same thing with Israel. Wow. And then that's why in the book of Zechariah, it mentions that uh, I think about a quarter or a third of the Jews That, how are you going to get there with today's precursors? See that? That's how you're going to get there. The Ukraine-Russia conflict and then also with uh, these things rolling out. It's all, the devil's doing all that so that we can get there. Do you see that now? All right. There's my wild theory right here, but I think it's on to something. It's all on to something. This is going to make a lot more sense, how you can get the world to go against God's people in the end. Now, uh, I want you to go to uh, Psalm 52. Psalm 52. Psalm 52. Uh, 55, excuse me, thank you. Psalm 55. Notice that this passage matches with Isaiah 28. It matches with Isaiah 28. It's about the tribulation as well. Isaiah 55. The verse says in verse 12, Isaiah 55, verse 12, notice that you can apply this to tribulation reference. Isaiah 55, 
We'll read verse 12. The Bible says, For it was not an enemy that reproached me. So Jew, right? A Jew saying, It's not an enemy that reproached me. Then can I have borne it. Verse 13, But it was thou a what? Man my equal, a fellow Jew. Oh, I wonder who you think that might be, huh? I think you guys can guess. We took sweet counsel together. Oh, so they had a council meeting together. And walked into the house of God in company. They were restoring the temple. Yeah. Let what? Death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell. That, that matches with Isaiah 28. They wanted to escape death and hell, didn't they? That's why they did that covenant. Remember Isaiah 28? It's to escape death and hell, the widespread sickness, right? That was in Isaiah 28, you recall that? But notice it bites back on them. It doesn't turn out well to their favor. So that's why the psalmist reads right here, no, let it betray them, let it come back to them, which it does happen. Revelation 6, death and hell don't play along their game. Keep reading down. It says uh, in verse 20, He hath put forth his hands against such as be at peace with him. He hath what? Broken his covenant. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet were they drawn swords. See? That matches well. This can apply to the Antichrist yeah. where he's deceiving and breaks the covenant and he tricks the Jews. Is this making a lot more sense now? Yeah, this is crazy. Okay. I think I'm on to something here. Now, go to the book of Romans 1 and 2 Timothy 3. Romans 1 and 2 Timothy 3. So, whoo, with their treaty, ha, is not referring to Daniel 9.27, when the man of sin makes his uh, peace pact yet, okay? That's not what it is. But I believe it has to do with Romans 1 and 2 Timothy 3. And these verses are written to the church, okay? You know what I think? I think that you need this, and guess what? This ain't the last. You need more of these. You know why you need more of these? You can, then these officials working for the NWO, they're so used to all talk and no action and breaking things to gain more power. That way when they make this big covenant with the Antichrist, it's not a problem for them to break it, and they won't have a guilty conscience over it. So they need more of that. They, we, they need to, these covenants need to come out to condition society more. They need to condition society more. So yeah, I believe that there's going to be a covenant or treaty of this that can go on seven years in the tribulation that the, that the Antichrist will make, but then... It, it all falls to pieces, as we've read through the scriptures. I believe in such a thing, but I don't, think, I don't see it as now. We need, the, we need this one to come in. We need the big boy to come in with this one. Keep an eye on Israel. Romans 1, what's going to happen in the church age? This is normal. Verse 29, verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, can that apply to our current leaders today? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Can that apply to today's leaders today? Yes. Yeah. Without understanding what? Covenant breakers. You need that. You need that a lot. Now go to 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. This know also that in the when? Last days, perilous times shall come. So here's the last days of the church. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud. Can that apply to today's leaders? Yes. All right. Blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. What? Truce breakers. That's, so we need a lot of this. this. 
This is where we're at, guys, with this. All this, what you're seeing, is applied to this. Okay, Pastor, you wrote his name right here, okay? So what does he have to do with anything? This is, uh, I always end my teaching with a big kick, right? Yeah, All right, brother. go to these two passages. I'm going to give you my big kick here. 2 Samuel 3 and Daniel 7. 2 Samuel 3 and Daniel 7. 2 Samuel 3 and Daniel 7. Now here's the big kicker. Why do I think that this is very necessary and we need more of this? Because here's the eye-opener. First of all, let's go to this guy here. Use your head now, okay? Why are leagues and contracts, treaties or whatever important? It's so that a person can have more obligation, more authorization to do things, more power. Leagues are important. Why? So that a person can have more power. You know why this is important for them? They can have more power. Okay. Now, if we were to use our heads here, I guess I'll drop the bomb right here, okay? Then one person gets all the power here, right? So then one person has all the power, and I'm going to give you the articles right here. This is a lot of power you're giving to these people. This is an article for some people who didn't know about this before. This is from BMJ, all right? So I think that's uh, the acronym for British uh, Medicine Journal. Yep. Title of the article is uh, from Lai Ha Chan, who the world's most powerful international organization? Mm. All right. UN is powerful, aren't they? They're very powerful. You know who's more powerful? You didn't know that? God said, let all the nations be gathered together at Armageddon. That's the Antichrist. Yeah. But there's an organization that's stronger than this. It's who? It says right here. What? Okay, thank you. The WHO has myriad functions. One of them is on providing advice on health policy to, to its member states. Although the UN is the largest intergovernmental organization and serves as the progenitor of most UN agencies, the veto power vested in the five permanent members of its Security Council often hinders its decision making. In contrast, no country can veto the WHO's decisions to issue health advisories. Even UN Security Council permanent members bow to pressure from the WHO as soon as it issues emergency travel advisories. How about that, huh? Now, another criticism might pe some people might say that, well, I don't know why you're so much against this because then what's your plan and your tactic uh, for making sure that these countries, they don't sneak their data and they're being dishonest, like China, right? So that they use China as an example, so they'll say, so this is necessary what who's doing, it's a good thing they're pushing. No, it, the easy answer is this, is that that's why we are not secular humanist kingdom builders. We are Bible-believing Christians. Why? Because no matter what plan you do in your government, and this is the problem with a lot of different denominations, all right? If you don't believe in King James only, dispensationalism, you're going to come up with this wrong doctrine. They're all trying to bring in their own kingdom and their solutions to the government. But guess what? It doesn't matter what it is. They all have a weakness. Capitalism has its weaknesses, socialism as well. I know that that sounds blasphemous to you, but it does. Amen. You know why? Because no matter how much man builds his or her own kingdom, guess what? If there is sin in the world, you're never going to annihilate the problem. When sin always exists in society, you can be full-blown capitalist or full-blown socialist, you'll still have problems. You need the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to come down. 
and set up the kingdom. So I would recommend people to watch our video, Amazing Dispensationalism Amen. from Genesis to Revelation, or buy that booklet that we have. It's in our link in our video description below, and it'll be very eye-opening. So that's the answer to that. Wow, they're that powerful. And guess what? This guy has a huge hand. Old Billy here has a huge influence. If you don't believe me, then uh, you haven't been researching enough. This is from Politico. And I quoted this before in other articles. Title of the article is, Meet the World's Most Powerful Doctor, Bill Gates. You might say why. Over the past decade, the world's richest man has become the who second biggest donor, second only to the United States government. Wow. Okay, that's huge, okay? This largesse gives him outsized influence over its agenda, one that could grow as the U.S. and the U.K. threaten to cut funding if the agency doesn't make a better investment case. Oh, kind of like how Trump did, right? Mm. About, I'm going to back off from who, and then who do you transfer the power to? Wow. Think about that for a while. This is uh, from an article from uh, SwissInfo.ch. Does Bill Gates have too much influence in the who? And actually, this person... Lawrence Gostin is faculty director of the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law at Georgetown University. You know what that person said? The person said this. Hails the generosity and ingenu ingenuity of the philanth philanthropies like the Gates Foundation, he does raise concerns about the over-dependence on private donations. Most of the funding Gates provides to the WHO is tied to specific agendas of the foundation. That means that the WHO cannot itself set global health priorities and it is beholden to a largely unaccountable private actor. Unlike the states, right, United States government, that's the first biggest donor. Well, they all have their accountability, right? But not private. The Gates Foundation has little democratic accountability, unlike the states. Wow. And then that's why Gates launched a team called GERM. And he wants to uh, launch this group called GERM where supposedly it's kind of similar to uh, who, what they were pushing with their treaty or the, what they were table talks, discussions were at least about, that how we're going to address the pandemic. And it's about like tracking, getting rid of the disease quickly, and a lot of your privacy is out the window pretty much, even though they claim that your privacy is still re retained. But the title of the article is from The Lancet. You can look up at The Lancet. Title of their article is Offline, Bill Gates and the Fate of Who. That's what it says right here. But it says right here, very interesting. It seems to have a negative pitch. Whose white paper is an ambitious land grab for power? That's what the, land, the Lancet said about all this. And they mentioned about Bill Gates' germ as well. Hmm. Okay, but let's be honest here. This is the big, I, big kick, okay? So 2 Samuel 3, let's look at this first, okay? Notice when a league is made that it's done so that a smaller group can have more power. Yeah. 2 Samuel chapter 3. Notice uh, what Abner said to David at verse 21. And Abner said unto David, I will rise and go and will gather all Israel unto my lord the king, that they may make a league with thee, and that thou mayest reign over all that thine heart desireth. Is that the same with the Antichrist? Daniel 11. Go back there, Daniel 11. A league made would give a smaller elite group of people more power. Daniel 11 again, verse 23. We read it before, right, about the Antichrist. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a what? Small people. Yeah, wow. When that big league comes out, you need little leagues right here to come out so that 
Smaller amounts of people can take charge. But how many people you need con to control the world? You ever thought about that? Let's say 10. One in charge of who? And another in charge of social network and space and Neuralink. And then that's not a lot, is it? All you need is 10 people pretty much. If we make leagues and contracts where it drops down to 10 people, all the Antichrist needs is, I need to be in charge of those 10 people. And then he rules the whole world. You see why this is serious, what this is going through? This is, what this is going through is not the big boy himself, the Antichrist. This is the one king. So what you're seeing right now is paving the way for the one king. And here's a, here's a bigger one. Ready for this? Come on. It's possible that we might see those ten kings before the rapture hits. Yeah, wow. Before the Antichrist comes in, mm -hmm. all these leagues and treaties coming out might pave the way for the ten kings first. And then the Antichrist comes in. You might say, well, where'd you get that from? Okay, so let's go to Daniel 7. Your hand's there, right? Daniel 7, verse 24 through 25. Let's end it here, 24 through 25. Now, think about this. I'm going to give you the, 15, the top, 15, uh, top 10 international organizations, okay? The top 10 international organizations are UN, United Nations Children's Fund, whoo! World Economic Forum, right? Klaus Schwab and the Great Reset and all that. International Monetary Fund, World Bank. There's your bankers who are part of the globalist elite. World Trade Organization, United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural or Organization. There you control the schools and education. South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation and uh, Association of Th Southeast Nations, ASEAN. There's also Asian African Legal Consultative, Consultative Organization, Australia Group, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, which is BRICS. Uh, let's see, how many was that? Was that almost 10? But basically, see, if you have, if those were 10 that I named, if you were in charge of all that, wouldn't you control the world pretty much? Now, let me give you 10 most powerful people, okay? This is from Textry. And this is what they claim are the 10 most powerful people, which I have a different list, okay? But let's just go by the secular perspective. Okay, you get uh, President Xi Jinping, okay, from China, one. Two, Vladimir Putin, Russia. Three, Angela Merkel, who has power and connections with the EU, de facto leader, European Union, okay? Then you get, uh, let's see right here, you also have... Narendra Modi in uh, India. Then you get Mohammed bin Salman al Saud, that's Crown Prince Mohammed. Jeff Bezos of Amazon. Elon Musk. Pope Francis. Joe Biden. <laughs> you know. so, but the point is, you get the President of the United States, right? Then you get Bill Gates. Okay, these are supposed to be the top 10 people. If you had your, one guy had his paws on all 10 of these, yep. wouldn't you control the world? Yep. You, see, that's why the uh, people are saying, we're still a democracy, still a democracy. Yeah, in 10 parts. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Then you need one guy in charge of that. Then you're under a communist regime. That's the genius of Satan. And I think they're going to come out first before the Antichrist. Why? Look at Daniel 7. Look at what the verse says. Daniel chapter 7, verse 8. And I considered the horns, those are, uh, verse 7, excuse me. The last part of verse 7 says, it had what? Ten horns, right? Yeah. Look at verse uh, 24. I'm going to go back and forth with verse 7, 8, and verse 24. And the ten horns, verse 24, and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, right? Mm -hmm. Verse 8, verse 8. Go back. Among the, verse 8, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. That's the Antichrist. 
He's after those ten horns. Yeah. Behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things. Look at verse 24, verse 24. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall rise, and another yeah. shall rise after them. Yeah. And he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. That's Antichrist, because look at verse 25. Yep. That's the Antichrist. He comes out after the ten. Well, so, how about that? That means if we're going to be raptured before the Antichrist shows up, who's before the Antichrist too? Yeah. Ten kings. They might come out. If you read Revelation 17, those ten kings are not regular humans. They're demoniacs. It may be where people saw some kind of weird activity with ten people, whoever they are, okay? Maybe it's Musk, maybe it's Gates, maybe it's these guys. But it's interesting some people claimed with Obama, Biden, all this kind of stuff, that they caught some kind of weird, inhumane activity that kind of looked not normal as a human. And they would claim there are satanic rituals, sacrifices, or reptilians among us. I don't know about all that, but could, they be on to, but could there be a, some little truth into that if Revelation 17 says that you need ten kings who are demoniacs? Wow. Now, it might be possible that we could be raptured, and then the Antichrist comes out with the ten kings, and then the Judas Iscariot Antichrist comes out after that. That could also be possible too. But it's also possible before the Antichrist comes out, when we, when we get out of here, these ten kings might just show up first. Keep your eyes peeled on those ten kings. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teaching has been incredibly eye-opening and also delicious into your word, Lord, and learning so much doctrine, what those words unfold, Lord and understanding better about the doctrines that we've put on a shelf and we start to see more into light, especially with things unfolding now. With things unfolding now, it makes those verses that we've put on a shelf more understandable, at least. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.